Um, so many traditional foods are considered potentially hazardous because, oh, sorry, but they also contain nutrients that can be beneficial for your health. Um, so these include the things like deer, elk, moose, game birds, fish, shellfish, and other wild game and aquatic life. So it's important to apply those um, safe food handling practices when handling those potentially hazardous foods. Um, typically, traditional foods such as game meat is not available for purchase in provincial grocery stores or served at most restaurants. Uh, therefore, most game and other traditional foods come from local hunters, fishers, and gatherers. Um, so if you are planning a menu at your facility or foods that include these traditional foods, um, you absolutely should. I'm just here to kind of share the safest ways to do it. So when I say potentially hazardous foods, what is that? Um, it just means potentially hazardous foods um, can support the rapid growth of pathogens, um, especially without proper food handling and refrigeration. So these are things like um, raw or undercooked meats, seafood, eggs, cut fruit and vegetables. I'll say, does anyone know what pathogens is? When I say pathogens, do you know how to define that? Mm -hmm. So when I say pathogens, it just means the, the microbes or the microorganisms that are gonna make you sick. So there's tons of microorganisms and microbes in the, in the environment, but not all of them are gonna make you sick. But with food safety, we're concerned about pathogens because they're gonna cause the illness. So animals, including wild game, um, can be contaminated by chemical contaminants, natural toxins, parasites, and bacteria. So once an animal is killed, there's an increased risk from contamination associated with the handling of meat from the time it's caught to the time it's prepared. So there's a lot to the flow of food before something shows up in your fridge or your freezer or on your plate, right? So this is where food safety comes in. You'll see little kind of picture. Um, those are the four main principles of food safety. So whenever we use food, we're keeping these things in mind. Cleaning, separating, cooking, and chilling. Um, this is very small. You might not be able to read it on your sheet. I'm not going to go over it in a lot of detail. It's just to kind of show you um, that there is specific things that are associated with game meat and fish. Um, illnesses, so there's foodborne illnesses, and there's also illnesses um, that come from handling the food, not just consuming the food. Um, so like I said, we can go over these kind of after, um, aside from the presentation, but this is just to give you an idea. Um, it's also not to scare you, it's just to make you aware, right? That's why we use food safety practices. Um, definitely not an expert in this, but thought it was worth mentioning. Um, chronic wasting disease. So chronic wasting disease, um, it's a fatal infectious, is a fatal infectious, that doesn't make sense, infection of deer, um, elk, reindeer, or moose that affects the central nervous system. So it's gonna include things like weight loss, abnormal behavior, lack of coordination, paralysis, excessive thirst or urination, and excessive drooling. So right now there's no known cure or treatment for chronic wasting disease. Um, it's just very important that hunters take precaution when they're field dressing um, and also when they're transporting and processing. Um, some of these precautions can include wearing latex or rubber gloves, um, deboning the meat from the animal, minimizing the handling of the brain and the spinal cord tissues, and making sure you're washing your hands and equipment thoroughly. And you can get the head tested if you were concerned, if you wanted to like freeze your meat and wait. If the animal was acting a little off, you can get the brain tested. Yeah, so that's what this okay. slide kind of goes over. I know it's kind of hard to see. You can find this online. I can give you the link if you're interested. Um, typically, we were seeing this in the south of the province, but you can see this is the 2022-2023 um, results. And it's kind of creeping north, right? So the Ministry of Saskatchewan offers a free voluntary testing program for all hunters. Um, hunters anywhere in the province are able to test deer, elk, moose, and caribou. 
Um, so fresh or frozen eggs can be dropped off at select offices. And the ones closest to us in kind of our communities, there's one here in Meadow Lake and there's also one in Buffalo Nero. <coughs> I have a question. How long does it take by the time you bring the head in to the time you know the results? How long does that take? About six weeks, it says. Oh, six weeks. Yeah. So it is kind of a long wait. It's not really an instant thing. So. Um, it is important to note too, a human case of CWD has never been identified, but transmission to humans cannot be excluded. Um, so as a precaution, that's why we recommend people don't eat meat from parts of a positive animal. So NINFA has developed a policy for game meat in care facilities. Um, you can find it on their website or you can get it from the EHOs and I'm pretty sure Nutrition has a copy as well. Um, so basically the policy aims to find balance between nutrition and food safety. Um, it's just important to note that no matter where the animal is caught, prepared, or served, um, there is that potential for foodborne illnesses to be involved. <coughs> So this is just a quick chart. Again, it's very small. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. But these are the 10 um, improper food handling practices that cause foodborne illnesses. So when we're talking about traditional food, it's important to keep these things in mind as you're kind of going through the flow of food. So during preparation, um, when the hunter is observing game, field dressing, transportation, storage, preparation, and leftover. So again, like I kind of mentioned before, there's a lot that goes into um, food safety from the time an animal is um, killed or caught or captured to the time it's going on your plate and even after that when you're cooling, you're um, storing and you're reheating food. So this kind of touches on observing the game for hunters. Um, those who hunt know how to do this and they know how to do it very well. Um, so just some general <coughs> guidance. It's important to pay attention to animals' appearance and behavior in order to identify those that may be sick. You don't want to kill any animals that appear to be sick. Um, typical signs of sickness include general poor condition, physical condition, um, if they have weight loss, if they're sluggish, if they seem like they're weak or moving kind of slow, um, swelling or lumps, any hair loss, blood or discharges from the mouth or nose, abnormal behavior, like maybe they're overly aggressive, and you never want to eat, handle, or eat an animal that's died from an unknown cause. So just a kind of a uh, couple points on lead. Um, some shot and bullets for hunting um, are made with lead. So lead is very toxic and it can lead to health problems um, mostly in children, but also adults. Um, and it can be also found in various fishing equipment. Um, so it, uh, it is discouraged to, to use lead, sh to discourage to use lead shot bullets and fishing tackle like jigs or weights, use material like steel or copper. Um, small amounts of lead can cause sleep problems, mood changes, and raise blood pressure. Larger amounts can make people very sick, like brain or brain or kidney damage, miscarriages, and developmental problems in young children. So babies and growing children absorb lead into their bodies more easily than, than adults, so they're a big concern, and they're sensitive to even small amounts. So if lead shot is used on harvested game, you just wanna make sure um, you're not eating the meat close to the bullet or the wound channel. Um, it's recommended about four inches away from that. And trying to give babies, children, pregnant women, anyone who's immunocompromised, um, maybe meat from the furthest away from that, that bullet channel. Just a couple notes on fishing safety. Um, you don't want to use fish from waters known to have high levels of contaminants. Um, not using fishing supplies containing lead, again. If you have an area um, prone to pollution or sewage contamination, you don't want to harvest those shellfish for eating. Um, and also don't use any shellfish that don't open once they're cooked. Um, it's always a good idea to check out sports consumption advisories before you head out. And choosing smaller fish, as older or bigger ones tend to accumulate more contaminants. <coughs> 
Um, so next, just some, some notes on oh, field dressing and transportation. Um, so field dressing, it's the process of removing the internal or organs of the wild game as soon after the animal is killed. Um, it makes the easier, animal easier to transport and it also helps with the cooling process because the idea after um, you shoot a game animal is to get the body cooled down as quick as possible. You don't want it to stay hot, right? So once the game has been field dressed, transported, and processed, it's important to store the animal according to food safety principles. Um, so just some tips here. Uh, should be done as quickly as possible. Um, using clean knives and also using a clean or a different knife um, between animals because you don't want to contaminate one if one is sick. Um, try to avoid puncturing or tearing the intestines. There's lots of bacteria found in the intestines of animals, um, especially deer. Deer can naturally carry E. coli in their intestines, so just being mindful of that. Dirt and other impurities should be removed as much as possible, especially any traces of fecal matter. Um, as you're doing this, just keeping a, keeping a look out for signs of abnormalities. Um, this could indicate that the meat is not safe to eat. So looking at color, odor, texture, again, any weird stuff, bumps going on, hair loss. Um, depending on where you're traveling to, uh, you might want to wait until you're out of the woods to skin. Um, the skin actually does protect the meat from contamination. You always want to use single gloves, um, single use gloves when field dressing. Again, the goal is to try to pull that animal as quickly as possible. Um, it's a good idea to place the animal on branches if you can during transport, just so it's kind of lifted up and there's some airflow underneath it. It's going to help with cooling it down. Um, and also try to keep the animal out of direct sunlight and other heat sources during transportation. Um, so storage and food prep. So if you're keeping meat frozen, it should be at negative 18 degrees Celsius or lower. That's a freezer temperature. Four degrees Celsius if you're keeping it in the fridge, that's a fridge temperature. So ensuring game is prepared at separate times or separate areas from approved foods. When I say approved foods, it just means foods that are from a provincially or federally um, inspected grocery store. Or store. Um, so cooking game meat to the appropriate internal temperatures. So why do we do that? Um, we use internal cooking temperatures for all meat, not just game meat, um, to make sure that the associated pathogens are killed and that it's safe for consumption. So you want to make sure you work with clean workspaces and you have hand washing supplies and sanitizing supplies close by. Um, another thing to note, if you have a meat, any kind of potentially hazardous food, but if you have um, a meat in the fridge, um, you want to use it within two to three days. And that's because food in the fridge doesn't actually stop growing bacteria, it just grows in more slowly. So that's why there is that recommendation. You also want to separate game meats from ready-to-eat foods when you're storing them in the fridge. So making sure you store any raw meat below ready-to-eat foods. A ready-to-eat food is just something that doesn't need any further processing or heat treatment. So things like um, pre-made salads or sandwiches where they're just ready to eat, you want to kind of keep them away from, from any raw meat to avoid any contamination of dripping and stuff like that. So these are just some internal cooking temperatures um, for game meats. Um, these can be found a lot of places online. So just making sure you always start with a sanitized, calibrated probe stem thermometer so you're getting an accurate reading. You're not doing any contamination. Um, so basically everything on the list, with the exception of a whole bird, um, you're, you're supposed to be cooking to 74 degrees Celsius. So, if you are planning on using game meat, fish, traditional foods at your facility, um, you just want to make sure the donations are coming from a reliable um, person. So, you want to be able to trust the person who's providing this to you that it was caught under safe um, and sanitary as they can be practices, right? Um, maybe just checking with um, who you're getting the donations from to make sure lead shot wasn't used to harvest. 
ensuring the meat has been properly stored prior to accepting it. So if it's coming to you and it was supposed to be frozen, make sure it's frozen. Um, making sure when you get it at your facility, it's still cold, right? Um, ensure you keep a record. Um, so include things like animal, the hunter, the date, the condition, the location. Ensure you're cooking the meat to the proper internal temperatures and using a probe stem thermometer. Um, and make sure those handling the food at your facility have a valid safe food handling course. And like Tammy said, we can, we can help you with that. And ensure your clients or customers um, <coughs> that gave meat is being served um, and include an alternate um, menu item for those who choose not to have it. So just letting people know that it is here, it's going to be served. If you don't want it, you can have something else. Um, so just an example of a tracking sheet. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. It's just nice to put it on paper so you have something to refer back to. So date received, name of hunter, um, contact info, what is it, how much of it are you receiving, um, where did it come from, and then any other things to note. So is that what you look for when you come to inspections? Um, if you do serve, we usually ask, do you serve any traditional foods or game meats? And then if you do, we'll, we'll see if you have any of this and see if we can help you out with getting it going. Um, so just a little note about leftovers. Um, leftovers are food that has been cooked but not served. And once food is served, um, but not eaten, it really should be discarded. So there's just some kind of rules of thumb when, what, when it comes to leftovers. Um, you want to cool your leftovers in shallow containers and don't cover it. If you're cooking big pieces of meat, if you can slice them up, they're going to cool faster and that's better. Um, cool quickly and refrigerate. So you want to have that done within two hours. Leftover should only be reheated one time. And you want to make sure when you reheat leftovers, the reheating temperature is 74 degrees, same as your cooking temperature for game meats. Um, you also want to make sure you're storing your leftovers in cover covered, labeled, and dated food safe containers. Um, <clears throat> if you can, it's better to serve small portions at a time. You don't want to put all it out at a time because, one, again, once you serve it, um, garbage. So if you can put the least amount out, then you'll have more leftovers. Kind of cut back on food waste. Is there any questions right now? I have a question. So you were talking about preparing um, traditional food and store food separately. And I'm just thinking like, does that mean you prepare your traditional food in your kitchen, you clean everything up, and then you take out, say, your chicken from the store, and then you do it, but not taking both up at the same time? Yeah, that would be... You don't need a different facility. No, but... don't need a different facility. You don't need, like, two separate fridges either if you're putting them in the fridge. Just, like, trying to keep them away from each other as much, much as possible or done at different times. While they're out. Exactly. Yep. Um, so I do have a little bit of a game. Next, I have a couple of probe stem thermometers, new digital ones, and some um, fridge thermometers. So that really helps with all this. So if you want to just quickly raise your hand or shout it out when I say the this or that part of this, if you know the answer, and if you can just give me one sentence why you think it is, maybe. So it's all stuff we covered in this. It's all stuff in your handout. Um, so, eat big fish or little fish? Why is that? I think big fish are... Tastes better, that's important. <laughs> so, also, bigger fish tend to accumulate contaminants. So, the bigger they get and the older they get, they're kind of holding on to what we want. I will give you the choice, and I only have a couple of each, so you want to be quick. Fridge, digital, 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 
<laughs> yeah, sounds <laughs> fancier. <laughs> <doesn't Yeah. it>. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, should you? Oh. <laughs> so, should you get organs removed and get fresh game cooled down, or wrap it up and keep fresh game warm? Keep it cool because we cool. The fresher you cool, the cooler it's going to be. Yep, basically, yeah. So um, because it's a potentially hazardous food, it can only stay out in what we call the temperature danger zone for two hours. So that's exactly it. It's, it's safer to get it cooler with. Digital Pro refrigerator. <laughs> so the next one, use food grade plastic or glass contain containers for gathering or use garbage bag for gathering. Plastic. Yeah, so I think I am. Uh, <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so I think I glossed over that quickly, um, but just making sure you use food grade containers. Um, things like garbage bags or I know like compostable bags, um, they have chemicals that aren't supposed to be in your food, right? And especially garbage bags, they have odor suppressing chemicals. So yeah, scented stuff. You don't want any of that in your food. <laughs> So, do you want to put leftovers in a used Ziploc bag and store it in the cupboard or cover label? Cover label, 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 label leftovers. Oh, she dumped her in there. You're like, what? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Why? Why do you want to do that? Um, uh, so, it's a. Uh, you're not contaminating any other leftovers. You cover it. Make sure it's that hot. And then you I think it's cool down. <laughs> Digital probe or fridge thermometer. That's the last one, so just just the fridge one left. <laughs> Accept traditional food donations from anyone who offers it, or ensure the donations come from a, a, a reliable source. Okay, who's the loudest? Me. I would. <laughs> <laughs> Who's the loudest? Yeah. Yeah. And the last one, use a probe stem thermometer when taking temperatures or take the temperature with the palm of your hand. Oh, no, no, no. Okay. Use a thermometer. Use a thermometer. I don't know who was first or that one. You could get that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll take it. it. Sure. <laughs> that? Yeah. So these are just some resources. They are in your handout. Um, just one thing I want to point out, if you're ever not sure, um, you can definitely give the EHOs a call. Um, I know a lot of people are scared to talk to us that they're going to get in trouble sometimes, but that's not what we do. We're here to work together and basically just make sure everyone's safe and healthy. Yeah. And that's everything from me. Is there any questions? Questions. Comments, stories, yeah. Um, I'm from English River and I work in a kitchen and this semester uh, I believe we're going to go into a home ec. How soon can you come and give these students the food handling certificate before they enter the kitchen? It's <laughs> <laughs> a funny question. I used to do English River. We just actually did, there's two EHOs and we just did community switches. So I actually don't cover English River, um, but I can pass it on to Yolanda. Okay, get, please. Get her to contact you guys as soon as she can. Also, what are your phone numbers and how can we reach you guys? Yeah. Yes, so my, yeah. my phone number I think I put on the start of this slide. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's too tiny, want me to mail it out? My cell phone, which is the easiest way to reach me, is 306-240. 
And then, and then, what about Yolanda? So if the schools are starting to get more donations of traditional food and they haven't had to cook a lot of that in the school, they can call you and you'll help them set things up for yep. Absolutely. We could we could come visit you and look at your space if you want to actually visualize like where should I be putting things, how should I be doing things. Um, we can send you resources, we can talk you through it, whatever whatever way you guys want to do it. We're here as a resource to help you guys. Okay. And not not just traditional foods, all all foods here interesting. 